How is it possible that plants can make your game better and make you look as if you are a truly great GM? Well, here's how. Hello, my name is Guy. We're looking at plants and how including them in your game can make your game feel just that much better and give you so many options that perhaps you haven't thought of before. Now, plants are a rather interesting group of um, th things that we find on our own planet. We have plants that live for hundreds or thousands of years. We have big plants. We have really little plants. We have plants growing on the underside of ice shelves and we have plants growing in the middle of deserts. I mean, they really are an incredible adaptable type of living organism. Now, when you then take that into your own world, whether it's a science fiction world or it's a fantasy world, suddenly those plants can take on even more interesting properties. Now, generally speaking, in science fiction worlds, plants become sentient, they start becoming cultured, civilized, or they just become orc boys. It doesn't matter. Plants start to take on a different form in the future. In the past, plants also tend to be ancient and wise, all-knowing creatures, and uh, oftentimes have amazing medicinal properties. So how do we combine those and how do we draw on those to make our games this much stronger? Well, the very first thing that you're going to remember is that this is not going to be suddenly nature walk where we are throwing in all kinds of terms like, oh, the hibiscus are looking particularly nice this day and the agapanthus has grown rather beautiful, but you can tell by the color of its flowers whether or not it's doing something with the soil. Whilst the agapanthus are doing that, the hydrangeas look lovely. We're not going to be doing that. That is not the purpose. That is not the porpoise. That is not the reason why we want to include plants in our games. Yes, we do want to add in a little bit of colour, but most of the time, if you say the cliviers are in bloom, your players are going to be going, yeah, all right, can I attack? Do I eat them? Does that mean anything to me? No, it doesn't. So we need to make ways in which they are meaningfully included in our games, but in which they make our games better, not just by including them. Oh, the forest is nice and green. Yeah, okay, great. Good. So what do we do? Well, first thing we're going to look at, we're going to look at plants in terms of locations. So plants make an excellent location, not just a jungle or a forest or an arboretum, but you could have tree houses in plants. It worked for Star Wars. I don't see why it shouldn't work for us. Gigantic tree houses. Traditionally, elves are tree dwelling creatures. That was one of the uh, paths that they used to take in the old days. The wood elf used to live in harmony with the trees and, you know, live in a tree, tree house, that sort of thing. But plants could be particularly large structures where the plants are the only ways to cross from one territory to another. They form natural bridges across giant chasms. They do all kinds of interesting things from that perspective. So the next time you are thinking of where do I situate my adventure, where do I have my master villain sitting or hiding, why not put it inside a plant? Go even further. The surface of plants are covered with things called stomata, st stoma, stroma, stromatopoeia. I think that might just be a type of word. Anyway, they're covered in these things which are basically their breathing holes that open and close depending on whether they're going to be letting out water vapor or not, whether the transpiration of that water coming out of the plant is going to be going up, or whether they seal it down again to try and retain moisture and water and that sort of thing. Nonetheless, you look at the surface of a leaf and it is a giant craterous place. Include that. The leaves you're running on, suddenly massive vents open up and this water just starts sending up. You've got these natural geysers that are starting to happen, geysers, however you want to pronounce it, suddenly bursting out of the plant's leaf surface. Or the trunks. We know that trunks are gigantic tubes, basically, running upwards and downwards, carrying water and nutrients up and energy down. So that is something that you could look at as well. So those are a few interesting things when it comes to locations. Now, when we then move forward and we say, okay, well, what's the next logical use of a plant in a fantasy or science fiction game? It could be as a sentient being, as a monster, if you like. Now, as a monster, you're going, okay, well, think about the difference between plants and animals. And we're talking primarily, if you are a sentient plant, you have grown up being fairly non-predatory. Let's be honest, most plant ancestry would involve just 
growing. Occasionally a Venus flytrap or something along those lines might have evolved a devious method of entrapping creatures to consume, but plants on, on, on average are not active creatures. They're not running around trying to eat us, thank goodness. So what would a sentient plant be like? I believe that they would be incredibly calm beings. They wouldn't have a huge amount of panic, provided that they can get sunlight, or if they are not perhaps from the surface, if they're from the underdark, or if they're from the underside of an iceberg, or wherever they might have grown up originally, they would be after some kind of nutrients. But there isn't that intensity, that drive, that passion to have to go and hunt down food. There also isn't necessarily that fear of having to run away from predators. Your great, 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 great ancestor, or anseed, I suppose you could call them, didn't run away when they were being eaten. They just stood there and took it. Or they developed poisons and spines and camouflage and all those kinds of interesting things. So again, I feel like a plant-based species would be one where there is no sense of wanting to kill each other. There is simply a sense of wanting to get bigger and take all the light or the food from one another. Very passive-aggressive species, if you think about it. Whether they are ants, whether they are orcs that are derived from fungi, and yes, I'm clumping them in the same thing as plants. Uh, if they were uh, pacifists who had the tendency to become murderous and were blue and budded every now and again, that's something to think about. I mean, quite a funny thing might be that you have this male member of the plant species, and one day he just starts spewing out tons and tons and tons of pollen in all different directions because he's mating, in inverted commas, by trying to find females of the species who are looking for the same thing. So you can have a lot of fun when it starts to come to unpacking how those monsters work. Again, I would start with a plant that you know, or Google, thank you very much, give me a plant, a weird plant, and then start to extrapolate from there. Now, when you look at the plants that are presented in certain rule books, you kind of go, well, this is really just a human that looks like a plant. I don't feel as if there is anything different to them. Now, this isn't an exercise on how to convert plants into living creatures, but it should be something that you are looking at as a GM in your own time going, well, mm, I actually want my plants to be a little bit more interesting. They're going to be focused on growing. They're going to be focused on growth. The biggest of them will be seen as the leaders. The little ones, the little saplings and things are going to be the ones that are being most energetic and trying to challenge the leaders for their, their space. Uh, anyway, so, so think about that. Plant speak. I talk about this in every video that I ever do on plants because I absolutely adore it and it keeps coming up. So we need to address it. How do you handle plant speak? How do you do it? Plant speak is most games will have it somewhere on the line. A druid or someone who understands how plants work will walk up to a plant and say, tell me who did what? Now, recently, I just had a murder mystery where one of the players, a druid, happened to notice that there was some mold growing in the corner of the room and uh, uh, some little fern-like structures that had taken root in the mold and um, asked if they could speak to the plant. They said, well, what happened here? Because the plant was a witness to the murder. This can derail your entire game if your game is based on them trying to find clues and stuff. Now they walk up to the plant and the plant goes, well, it was terrible. It was absolutely awful. I mean, that one came in and killed that one and there was blood everywhere. That's not how a plant is going to perceive things. A plant is there to grow. Now, the spell imbues a plant with a certain sentient ability to answer questions. I always try to answer those questions from the plant's perspective. Well, a big mobile one walking one ape and however you want to describe it came in and that one there was there and then the ape moved its arms and then that one fell over and now there is food and i'm growing towards that one you've got to try and try and make it feel as if the plant is giving an account from where it's based. Now, if it's a little fungus, it would say the giant walked in and the giant did this. Let your players go, there was a giant in the room? That's terrifying. They should, if they want to speak to plants, realize that plants are going to have different perspectives. Just the same as trees would be saying, well, the little one came in and then the other little one came in and then it looked as if they sort of were trying to grow together for a moment or two and then they split apart and the one was leaking all of its sap and the other one then moved away very very quickly leaving the other one but was still spewing sap to return to the ground and now it is starting to feed my offspring 
that is literally what the plant is doing. It's saying, well, the nutrients is there. I'm going to go and start growing in it. I mean, because that's what they do. So try and think of it about that uh, along those lines. Now, I usually, if I'm having, if I'm dealing with trees and things, I will do leave motions. I will have the trees kind of blowing in the wind. They'll talk about the danger one. Uh, try and make it as physically uh, plant-like. You know, ooh, danger. We didn't want to leave. Uh, and of course, you can throw in the pun. So think about how your plants are going to speak, but think about the size of the plant and what the plant's objective is as to, to what type of nutrients it might go for. And yes, it does help to have a certain botanical knowledge, but just go for a walk when it's safe in a botanic garden and speak to some people and you'll be amazed at what you learn. Just say, what's the weirdest plant in the garden? I'll be like, oh, well, that's the plant that grows upside down. What? Yes, absolutely. Anyway, so we talk about uh, plant speak. Ingredients. Something that used to frustrate me a huge amount is that I have, I would say, a passing knowledge of certain types of plants that one could use in the wild for certain things, like uh, willow bark for headaches and mild pain, um, aloe for sunscreen or as a disinfectant or as a lubricant. Um, all these different types of things you just pick up as you go along if you're open and receptive to it. If you're not, though, you can shut down a player who's super excited about it very quickly and give them a bad game. I had a druid character that I was playing. This was now easily 25 years ago. And the druid wanted to go into the, into the forest while there was downtime and collect herbs. The GM simply said, what's your survival check or your nature check? Okay, good. Roll a d20. And I rolled a d20 and he said, right, you find five herbs. Well, what herbs did I find? And he went, well, you just find some medicinal herbs. They'll, 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 you use them in your spells and things. Yeah, but what herbs? Did I find herbs that prevented infection? Did I find herbs that reduced pain? Did I find hallucinogenics? Did I find this? Did I find that? The challenge is, is that if you don't give specifics, your world will feel a little bit boring and flat, and the player is not going to engage with their going out and finding herbs. The player is going to go, yeah, all right, my druid goes and finds herbs. Yep, I find five. Thank you very much. That's not role playing. That's just number rolling. I mean, that's table lookup. That's boring as far as I'm concerned. So if you say, right, well, roll a d20. OK, five plants. Right, roll a d six or uh, don't even make them roll just say right you find oh you find a very rare um white flower which you know has the ability to restore a certain amount of life so if you were to brew this into a tea it would give back to everyone who drank the tea within an hour of it being brewed it would give back two hit points you can make it absolutely negligible absolutely negligible. Two hit points is neither here nor there by the time the characters are running around the forest collecting stuff. And if it is significant, well then the druid has just found themselves something to do other than shapeshift into a giant werewolf, bear, badger, whatever. And <coughs> and that's 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 all that we, we need to do on that. Because you then, the next plant, oh, well you found something that will help you sleep. It won't put you to sleep, but it will put you in a very calm state. Well, that doesn't have any immediate game mechanical effect. No, it doesn't. But we're both after the flavoring here. We're both after the role playing. It could also be that they find that there are no plants that have any medicinal value in this region. That happens. You can spend a whole day wandering around a field and find absolutely nothing of value aside from maybe a few little bits and pieces here and there. And they don't have to be dramatically huge. There's a reason why there are healing magics and there's a reason why spells that heal do, you know, cost reserve and all that sort of stuff. Just let them have little breaks and you'll be amazed at how it works. And of course, throw in a descriptor, a red flower, a pink flower. It doesn't have any flowers. It's got purple spots on its leaves. It's ground cover. Whatever. All right. And then finally, because we don't want to go on for too long about plants, law. When we think of plants, plants are absolutely amazing in our own society. Now, I've spoken about florography. Florography, the art of using flowers to convey a message. If you were sent a lily, it meant I like you as a friend, but not as a lover. If you were sent a carnation, it meant I wished you would drop dead. Don't ever come back and visit me again. All these kinds of things that were encoded into flowers by the type of flower. And if you understood the code, you'd understand what the flower meant when it was sent to you. So we have that kind of law. We have the whole when the last petal of the last rose of summer suddenly drops, that is when the world will end. 
It's an insignificant detail, but it's absolutely brilliant. Now, of course, there is that incredibly heart-rendering story of the uh, patient in hospital who f they had been told that they were going to die. They had very little chance of survival unless they really wanted to survive. But um, they still they were young, and there was this elderly gentleman in the bed next to them who said, you should live because you want to live, and life is good. And the patient went, no, it's not. It's sucky. I, I'm miserable. I am death, I am going to die, and life is terrible. And the old man believed so much in this person, for whatever reason, that um, they said, well, all right, fine. We'll both survive until the last leaves of autumn have blown from that tree. And the person said, yes, all right, fine, thank you very much. All right, fine, I'm miserable, but I might as well bet on leaves determining my fate. So yes, when the last leaf of that tree has fallen in the autumn fall, I will then die. And then, of course, you know, autumn goes on and they're both kind of going through it and the old man is getting worse and the patient is kind of still being miserable and morose and all that sort of thing. Then eventually the old man suddenly vanishes, vanishes. There's one leaf left on the tree and the old man has vanished. Is the old man the leaf? Has he turned into the leaf? No, the silly old bastard's gone outside, painted a leaf onto the wall behind the tree from the correct perspective of the patient's bed that he was encouraging to stay alive. The patient looks out the tree, looks out the window, obviously not wearing glasses, sees the last leaf of autumn is still there. They hang on just a little bit longer and then they survive and they pull through and they go, yay, I'm so glad I survived until that last leaf on the tree was there and, you know, life is brilliant. And then they discover the old man's body in the snow because he died painting the leaf to keep the person alive and you go oh that's awfully tragic that's miserable that's awful that's absolutely awful to think you know that um one would do that sort of thing and to someone who didn't want to live maybe they did want to live i don't know maybe i cocked up that story I, either way it's an entire story based around a plant or a lack thereof or the cycles of the plant the point is you could have a plant as a MacGuffin in your adventure and all it does is it gives the people to something to cling on. Beauty and the Beast, the Rose. Uh, there are so many different things. Sleeping Beauty, the Thorn. By adding in the flower, by adding in a plant into your game, what you are doing is you are making the whole thing just feel as if it is more alive. Because you are simply checkboxing, tickboxing, checkboxing, what's wrong with you today? Uh, all you are doing is you are tick ticking little boxes in your players' brains going, oh, the story is so complex and there's so many moving parts and there's this flower that we know will only bloom under the certain conditions of a full moon and we have to get that flower to cure the werewolf cure to do this. It's just adding layers of complexity to your narrative, to your game, that will make your game feel as if it's truly epic. And that, of course, is the entire goal of this channel. And all that's doing is making you have a better game and your players to sit back and go, oh my god, you are an amazing GM because you're throwing in all of this kind of stuff. We would never have even have thought what about this kind of stuff? It's brilliant. Where did you come up with it? You came up with it by doing a little bit of research and watching this video. Anyway, if you liked what I was talking about in today's video, or if you like improving your game and you think that this channel helps you, as so many people do, hit that like button or the subscribe button. Um, we've got a big number that we are rumbling towards, which is quite exciting. Quite, quite, quite... Um, quite humbling as well to realize how many people have watched these videos. Anyway, uh, Big thank you to you for watching all the way to the, through to the end. Now, inspiring today's video, genuinely inspiring today's video, and making making me revisit plants and rethink plants and try and re-include plants is World Anvil. World Anvil is running a competition for the next couple of weeks, I believe, on plants. The competition is simply create an account with World Anvil, a free account or a subscribed account. And if you do make a subscribed account, use the code GREATGM for a discount. Now, the competition is on creating your own plant. Come up with a plant within your world, whether it is a functional plant, whether it is an item of clothing, whether it's used for building, all the things that I didn't touch on in today's video, all those kinds of things, as well as if it's a plant species, if it's medicinal, if if it's religious, if it is used in some kind of ceremony. It is all part of their competition. They've got prompts, they've got videos to help drive your imagination, to help you include this plant in your world, or plants in the world. Why just do one, I say? Do as many as you can. It makes your world feel that much better. Nonetheless, a big thank you to World Anvil for sponsoring today's show, and for you to watching all the way through to the end. Until next time, I wish you and yours the very happiest of gaming.